Um, thank you. Um, so just before I get started, I, I want to tell you there's uh, something in the New York Times that is on their online um, opinionator page, and it's called The Stone. It's for philosophers to comment on different things. And I don't know if any of you saw this, but um, did any of you see it? It's just today, right? It, well, it actually came out last night. So I'm just going to pull out one of their pullouts, which is the key feature of empirical testing is not that it's infallible, but it's self-correcting. And it really talks about the tension between observational studies and randomized controlled trials. So I think this should be a, a end of conference reading. So um, I just have um, a few thoughts that, um, that I wanted to, to put forward after listening and, um, and taking in all of the discussion, which has been really invigorating to, to hear. First of all, um, the discussion has blissfully, for the most part, avoided the observation versus RCT um, conundrum, so to speak, um, and acknowledged the challenge inherent in multiple uh, approaches to studying different aspects of um, clinical care. And I think we got to a level of discussion today which really got to the meat of um, what study designs are appropriate for what type of um, uh, questions. So, uh, decision makers consistently convey their needs as a function of, um, of the applic applicability of findings as they go about their daily lives. And today's session was actually very articulate about that. Um, and, you know, I think one of the issues that we've avoided a lot is paying as much attention to that as we probably should. And Mark talked about um, his study that was published in The Lancet. Um, we, we actually had the privilege of funding that study, but also of translating the results um, to patients and um, clinicians. And we did this through a series of um, uh, techniques, including cognitive testing and focus group testing. And at one point, um, it was shocking to us the different perspective between clinicians who treat patients. Um, either using PCI versus um, cabbage in patients who are recipients of that treatment. Um, the clinicians were obsessed with mortality as an endpoint. Um, patients were actually uh, obsessed with um, angina that was disabling and got quite angry when we tried to put the dissemination document in the context of um, mortality. You will live longer. And for them, it was much more important whether or not they could lift their grandkid um, to the top bunk. So um, there's a, a danger of relying on only the direction of effect, which is another thing that was studied. And Bob, you were very um, eloquent in making that comment. Um, but in non-studied populations, and particularly the elderly, which may have different metabolic um, effects, uh, we know that tightly controlling hemoglobin, hemoglobin A1C in and elderly folks over the age of 65 may do more to fuel um, orthopedists who are uh, repairing their hip fractures when they go down in the bathroom and um, because they have low blood sugar. They just may not be as resilient. So we just need to make sure that we pay attention to applicability issues and um, also um, the needs of decision makers. So there, I pulled out six facts that I thought were important for PCORI um, and all of us in here as researchers and funders of researchers, funders of research, although some less than others now, um, and um, those of you who are desperately trying to get funding for research. Um, so one of the things that I thought the New York Times article, uh, Opinionator piece, very nicely showed is that few studies are robust enough to stand on their own. Um, that's not, that's an oversimplification. But, you know, those of you in the room who like to think about looking across a body of studies um, to see how robust the findings are. Um, so we've more or less been talking about individual studies and study designs um, in the past day and a half. And I think we have to recognize that what we need to think about is a body of evidence and the quality of the evidence that contributes to that body. And um, my second point is many, many studies are designed, um, and I have this in quotation marks, without rational intelligence. And for those of you who lived through the um, 
CER debate, I don't mean rationing intelligence, I mean rational intelligence. Um, so you can see I have PTSD from that. Um, <laughs> So, and the question that I have um, often had in speaking with colleagues who are looking about funding different studies is, you know, why would we compare an intervention, for example, um, with usual care rather than um, learning what we can learn from standardized aggressive medical therapy so that we can learn about um, whether or not a comparator is, stands up to um, a more, um, invasive in intervention so that we can make the determination, should we pay for both? Um, and so just sometimes I think clinical studies are, are not designed with their um, application and decision making in, in, um, at the beginning. And then, um, so one of the things that I want to go back to for my third point is that we seldom endorse or refer to the body of evidence as a living dynamic resource. Um, but we often advocate for individual acronym-based studies. And um, kudos to everyone who comes up with these great acronyms. I'm horrible at it. Um, but I mean, I think sometimes that's, the, you know, whether it's, you know, I don't want to give an acronym because then that'll tilt my hand. Um, but it, it, the point is we often, wait with bated breath for that one study that's going to come out, and we don't know really when it's going to come out, um, and then try to figure out how that fits in um, to, into the whole remainder of the literature on that area. And um, I think we need to flip that and think about we have this body of evidence. What impact does this new study have on that body of evidence? Um, and then my fourth point is um, numeracy issues uh, is, a, is not a disease limited to patients. Um, I have often been, um, I guess appalled might be too strong of a word, but not really, um, appalled at hearing and listening to even young medical students right out of training where they don't really understand basic constructs of relative risk versus risk, um, pro progression-free survival. Um, as opposed to um, mortality. It's just, you know, it's, we can't assume that people understand the level at which a discussion like this takes place. And if we're not the right people to do this translation or dissemination of what this means, we have to create a body of science um, to make sure that happens. So that um, brings me to my fifth point. And I only have six, Michael, so that's good. Um, we fail to put the same emphasis on the science of how best to communicate uncertainty, and Hal, don't laugh, because um, he hears me talk about this a lot. Um, we fail to put the same emphasis, emphasis on the science of how best to communicate uncertainty in evidence for the population and the individual. And we aren't very good at incorporating uncertainty into robust tools for decision making. Um, and everything has uncertainty with it especially if you're dealing with applicability issues um, and um, limitations of certain types of study designs. So because we're talking about observational studies here, there are obvious limitations to ob observational studies that can be communicated. And this last session, I think, was really getting at those issues of communication about what trade-offs we're making with different study designs and why we're making those trade-offs. I mean, we should be making those trade-offs consciously at the very beginning at the funding and, and developing of a protocol of a study rather at the end. And then finally, my last point, um, and this is definitely germane to the last um, session, you know, we are beginning to demand a level of transparency in terms of studies that are published in journals, um, um, particularly um, in the systematic review world, um, in how observational studies are evaluated. Um, and how randomized controlled trials are evaluated. We're funding um, a system review database of studies that have been evaluated for their quality. Um, but we need to have that same transparency of inputs and algorithms and protocols and patient reported outcomes um, as a rule and not an exception. So this really needs to be very important, particularly when we're talking about um, decision modeling. Um, and um, how we choose uh, outcomes that are important to patients to measure in clinical studies. So I think all of these are areas where PCORI could fund 
very um, vibrant research and set standards um, that would have an impact on um, the whole research enterprise. Thank you, Jean. And a common theme uh, throughout many of them was uh, your um, emphasis as the ruler uh, in um, uh, communicating uh, the fact that um, evidence is dynamic uh, and that none of these methodologies will yield the, the definitive answer and helping the public to better understand that through your transparency initiatives, your communication initiatives, the notion of a, of a continuous growing body of evidence. Steve, 